Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on this super gloomy, rainy. It was sunny earlier day, but now it's gloomy and rainy again. How's the uh, weather on the other side of the country, Watchful? Uh, it's just overcast right now. It's actually been quite a nice day. It's like a perfect 65, 70 degrees. Not too <laughs> extreme. Not wet. Yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah, I think the rain is good. We've needed rain. It's been raining the last couple of days. Um, it's, um, it, we had an interesting storm last night. It was trees were bending over and power went off around the town. And, um, oh, yeah, that's right. No, that, it, that was the other night. This one, this time I've made sure all my stuff in here, including my router, uh, and the other room is on battery UPS. So if for some Smart. reason, um, cause I, I thought I had it all figured out because I forgot the router went on UPS. So sure. The office stayed up, but uh, I forgot I needed internet. Internet went down. Do this. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been watching BP earth watch. He's been talking about the storms. I guess there's a big one that's about to hit kind of your area uh there's florida i think um they're getting ready to uh get hit and then where is it it's in it's 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 it wasn't in georgia but it was the carolinas i think carolinas and florida um but it kind of looks like it's just gonna miss you but it looks like it's a pretty big storm that's coming in yeah yeah you know i got lectured tonight for not dressing professional that I am a 50 year old man and no longer a teenager. (laughs) (laughs) Is that, yeah, I don't want to get into our channel or uh, for our channel. I guess just, just in general. I mean, well, when I go to work, I, I I put on our company shirt and, um, I dress a little more appropriately, but, um, you know, I am who I am. I, I shouldn't have to fake who I am just for presentation of what people may consider and judge me based off of my uh, dress code and stuff of that nature. So that's just never been a thing for me. I, I've never really, it's never bothered me what other people think. You know, yeah. I I dress the way I dress because it's comfortable for me and I don't try to justify it. So Hopefully you don't have a problem with it. Watchful. I mean, you would be the one. No, person I don't have that... a problem. I'm the same. I'm the same way. Half the time I look like I live on the street because I don't really care what other people think about me. However, I will say as somebody who does not care what people think about me, uh, I do go through the trouble sometimes depending <laughs> on where I'm going to make sure that I don't look like a bum. You know, if I'm going to church, I'm going to look casual. Yeah, that's, nice. going... that's a different story. Yeah. It just depends. Yeah. You know, I'll dress appropriate for the venue, but my everyday life, I look like a bum. <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely don't go to church in a wife beater. Uh, I put on a, a shirt and, um, you know, that's even though it's not required, I think it's just a, a matter of respect for the building to, you know, be presentable just because oh, we sure. are going in God's house and. You know, I, I kind of teeter tot on that, that whole concept, but again, you know, just out of respect for the people there and whatnot, but you know, when I'm home or streaming on the air, I, it's, I'm just me and I I don't feel like I have to, you know, pretend to be something else. I just, you know, it's, it's me. So hopefully folks in the audience don't mind that. Uh, this is just who I am. I think but, you're over it. Yeah. I, well, I used to catch a lot of slack at first. I would typically average one message a day from random people that told me to please put on clothes because it offended them. And, and uh, it's, I mean, the reality of it is I get wound up when I'm talking and I get passionate about it. And it sometimes it gets hot in this room that's filled with all these computers. So oh, yeah. uh, otherwise... You know, I can run a fan. I have a ceiling fan over me, but it bleeds into the microphone real bad. So, anyways, um, let's see. Um, what were you hearing today as far as news and whatnot? I really um, missed everything. 
<sighs> There's uh, so let's start with the uh, the eclipse. So I haven't seen anything that is like monumental that uh -huh. happened on the day of the eclipse. Uh, been looking, uh, <laughs> trying to pay attention. Um, the the most notable thing that really happened was uh, what was it? Palestine requesting um, to be added into NATO. Uh, that was something that happened. Um, you know, you know, it's interesting. I was telling Kip this earlier that um, event if if they're global events that are hap if there's a sign in the heavens that are marking a global event. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like you may not know what the event was until later on. So I was telling her that in uh, 2019, when uh, you know the uh, the event that affected us for four years happens. Uh, you know, we didn't know about the the date that the first incident occurred uh, on the day of the incident. It actually took several months, and then it didn't even took up to a year before they pinpointed the day, and it just so happened to be on the day of an eclipse. And what's interesting, I think, about that is when you're reading about the seals, the living creatures that say, come and see, it's almost as if they're the ones who are indicating whether it's a global event or not. Yeah. Uh, so this sign that happened on on just a couple days ago on the 8th, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was marking a global event on the day. It seemed more of a warning of something that's coming. So Yeah. I honestly, uh, I know I've already said this once, I honestly think it marks a transition period. Mm. Um, it, it Clearly, uh, it's, it's difficult to tell right now, but I think over the next month or two based off of what events happen if any happen at all it, it will be more clear exactly what the transition was if there was one at all like you said sometimes yeah. it takes a, a a period of time for you to actually have enough data to make that assessment um yeah but time will tell especially the timing with What's going on with uh, Persia and the Holy Land? Mm. They, it's they've been in they, the news quite a bit. There's definitely conflict over there. Uh, also, uh, you know the uh, the conflict to the north. Uh, you know that's been going on for a long period of time. There's a there's quite a bit of news in that regards. Um, you know nothing that we really that's worth really going into detail about. Mm -hmm. Just kind of the same thing is continuing to happen. We're definitely experiencing conflicts. Uh, you know, people are definitely suffering persecution, both in that conflict as well as in the Holy Land. Um, you know, things yeah. are things are happening in the Holy Land. You know, so they're the, you know they're they're escalating. <clears throat> so here's the thing about this escalation that people are concerned about is that the Holy Land's neighbor uh, Persia, they have made some monumental threats. Hmm. Um, as of late, over the last week. So much sure. so that if they do not take action, they will totally lose face in the international community. It, it, yeah. is, it, it is on that level that that is the reason why they are adamant that something will. Because before, they, most of everything that they said was through proxies and some of their proxies doing this and proxies saying that. This is different. The Alatoa, uh, Ayatollah, however you say mm -hmm. that, um, their supreme commander has made direct threats as promises for action. Mm. So that's where it gets somewhat interesting because if they don't follow through, it is going to be a major sign of weakness that other enemies of that state might take advantage of. Speaking of which, there's that, uh, that island next to Japan that's got the north and the south that are divided in half that, you know, the mm -hmm. U.S. went to war with the north side during the 60s or 70s. That crazy leader has told their people, it is time for WAR. And that they are wow. prepping for something. Um, yep. So it's a precarious position uh, that the world is in. 
Yeah, it seems like things are definitely coming to a head. Um, why don't we, if you're ready, if you have any, I don't have any more news. Uh, well, I was going to mention one more thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, OJ kicked the bucket today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I wonder. Miss him? Well, I wonder if in the end he, he made amends. Confessed. Well, yeah. just made amends with the father, you know, cause yeah. The more that we've been studying these times when someone prominent like that and they, they pass, you wonder where they went and you almost feel bad or, or you rejoice for them because yeah. it's, um, you know, it's just something I think about. So uh, I wonder, um, James said, yes, he did. Is that a yes, he did repent or... Yes, he did. Oh, he's a nut job. Uh, okay. So, um, it, it makes you wonder, where do you guys think he went? Up or down? Um, I pray that he resolved his, his conflict with the creator and, you know, made peace and came to terms. You know, Repented you, and asked for forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you really don't wish... Uh, the hot place on anyone. No. And it's it's something that weighs heavy on my heart with with folks that I know and deal with on my daily life. You know, it's, mm. it's you just you don't wish that on anyone. But all right. So what's the first topic that you were gonna brief yeah, us so on today? today? Yeah, so today is Nissan four. And you can switch to my screen if you want. Sure. <clears throat> so today is Nissan 4. Today is the day that Lazarus actually fell asleep. And by fell asleep, I mean he passed away. Uh, if you were to overlay the timeline of the events leading up to the Passover when Jesus was crucified, um, today is the first record that I could actually find in the Gospels. Now, it may be be possible to trace back, you know, the days previous, you know, yesterday and the day before to Nissan one, but it's not clearly evidence. Um, and we're going to get into some really cool gems that I, some of them, I only just discovered right before coming on where I uh, was talking with Kip and she had brought something up and I had mentioned something and we started talking about it. And then we came to a realization that uh, we may have discovered a little gem um, don't know if we'll get into that today uh, because so here's the order of events. If you can see this timeline here. So this is where we're coming at to now. So you can see uh, this little red dot indicates where we're at. So this is Nissan four and we pick this up in John 11. Uh, now what I want to do is go through and just read John 11 and talk about the events uh, that happens. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of foreshadowing here. Uh, you're going to see that when Jesus hears the news, he decides to stay where he's at for two days. And tomorrow being our Sabbath, uh, it's convenient because this gives us time to actually look at what may have happened on those two days while he was waiting. Uh, and that's where that little gem comes in. And we're going to talk about that. I don't know. We may talk about it today, maybe on Saturday. We'll just see what happens. So let's let's go said, look at John 11. Yep. There you go. That, that's what I was like. Thank you. John 11. Yep. Got it. Yeah. So I am going to bring up this map here so you guys can see the events that we're about to talk about take place in Jericho. So this is where Jesus is during this time. And uh, for the next couple of days, I'm going to be uh, actually up until the 14th. Uh, we're going to be the, the location and moving around is going to be wild because we're able to actually track where he was, where he moved to basically the order of events uh, leading up to his crucifixion. So this should be a lot of fun uh, to go through these events. So we're starting here in Jericho and then we're going to pick up in John 11. Uh, and, and I'll just start reading and then we can chit chat <clears throat> as we go through here. It's not a really long chapter. I don't know if we'll make it through. I mean, it's 55 verses. We'll see how it goes. All right. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, 
the town of Mary and her sister, Martha. Wait, how does that read? Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, the town of Mary and her sister, Martha. That doesn't read right. Why is that not reading right to me? Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. It reads the same way. I'm in the King James Bible. I'll read it as well. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. There we go. Okay. It it, it was that Mary who anointed. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. Okay. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That's a figure of speech called Minnie Ann's. <laughs> Just pick <laughs> that up. Uh, uh, I have this book from E.W. Bullinger called uh figures of speech used in the bible there's hundreds of them like 900 oh really oh yeah, I we like only him use about, yeah we only use about 200 figures of speech in the english language there's like 900 that are used in the bible i like anyway, that author um, yeah ew bolger is awesome he's got some amazing tools now jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus so when he heard that he was sick he stayed two more days in the place where he was then after he then after this he said to the disciples let us go to to judea again so where they're at now so if look here so he's in jericho now and then they're going to stay there for two days so one day two day and then they're going to travel from jericho up here to judea and that is how far of a walk is that it's 26 miles. So that's if you use, these are, these are modern day roads. So when I was uh-huh. doing these maps, I was doing modern day roads. It could have been shorter. So it could have been more of a straight shot, but I imagine that the terrain, the roads are probably relatively close to what they were during his day. And, and they walked so, almost everywhere, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, like so they weren't, you they imagine weren't walking horseback. 26 miles. Yeah. They weren't horseback, right? Possibly. Yeah. You know, I mean, they had horses back then. Horses aren't 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 a new invention. No, no, I get it. But if thinking about it, I've never seen really any scripture of Jesus and the disciples riding horses anywhere. A donkey. He rides a yeah. donkey. Well, he, yeah, I, I get that, and that was one of those isolated times. But I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But it seemed like they walked everywhere. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Okay, so we are going to get into this today. <clears throat> so what's interesting, <laughs> Kip, Kip asked me, she goes, because she had asked, oh, are you going to talk about Lazarus and the rich man uh, in the bosom, bosom of Abraham? And I, I put a question in there going, oh, I wonder if those are parallel records. Um, So I actually went and read, and so that record is actually in Luke 16. So here, let's go look at Luke 16. And the rich man and Lazarus. So in about 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now notice that this is a certain beggar named Lazarus. He doesn't say his friend whom he love. So it's entirely possible that this is a different Lazarus, but I'm going to show you something that's going to blow your mind. But we're going to finish reading this first. Certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, so that it was the beggar. So it was that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being tormented in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bo- bosom. I'm going to avoid getting into the details of this one um, until probably Saturday, but I just wanted to 
put a pen in this for you right here so you guys can go study this yourself. Now, if we skip forward to Luke 18, so he he tells several par- parables here. So he basically he's doing teaching for um, Luke 16, 17, and then in Luke 18, if you come down, I didn't keep my highlight. I had a highlight in here. Um, where? So we're we're not we're not going to read the um, sixteen of we'll be, everything that yeah, Jesus we'll be here said. All, we'll be here all day long if we read all of that. So I just want to show you something that okay. Um, that we can look into further over the, because we got two days of content here to actually sure. get from these. So this is just kind of planting the seed so that I got we it. can research this. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, so fast forward to Luke 18. Yep. And then in verse 31, I did highlight it. It's down here. So in Luke 18, 31, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Now, the reason why I I showed you those two sections, because right here, if we go back to John 11, 8, it says, The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again so judea is just north of jerusalem a little bit so they're right here now so he was in jericho and they're traveling up here to judea and then you'll find later on as we continue in these days that he traveled down here to jerusalem my point in in showing you these two records so uh, for those of you who are taking notes for your own personal study look up john 11.8, Eleven eight, mm-hmm. where he talks, uh, where the disciples talk about him being stoned if he goes to Jerusalem, right? And then look at Luke eighteen thirty one, where he pulls the disciples aside and tells them that he's going to Jerusalem. My point is, is these seem to be talking about the same time. Oh, sure. Which would, which would mean that when Lazarus had died during those two days that he waited in Jericho, he very likely taught about Lazarus, the beggar who was in Abraham's bosom. Oh, he did. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you yeah. understand what I'm saying? Oh, I do. So this it's, is kind of, it's the same story. It is. So, but, but they're uh, because they're talked about differently. So Lazarus in John 11 is called his friend. Right. However, in Luke, he's just referred to as Lazarus the beggar. It, so there's it, not it, a there, the, it's the the name is the only thing that ties them together. I, I but get what it. This, it, yeah. So it, what this is me, showing, though. Go ahead. It, let me just comment real quick. So, you know, it's Luke and John. These are the disciples that are with him. So each one of these passages is from the perspective of that different disciple of the Mm -hmm. same interaction which is what's really awesome about matthew mark luke john all of these is they all tell the same story but from a different vantage point from their own interpretation so that's what's really cool about this so no you're spot on um that clearly john um knew lazarus more than luke well, yeah. So the the four synoptic gospels, uh, the um, they don't all include exactly the same information. Um, for for instance, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the only ones that include the Olivet Discord. John doesn't actually include the Olivet Discord. Hmm. Um, the discourse, not Discord. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the Olivet Discourse. It refers to it, but it doesn't include any of the details about it. But what we can do is we can take these these Gospels, and by tracking the timeline, 
Mm-hmm. And seeing where he was, you can get a more complete picture. So oh, in yeah. John 11, we actually see his where he traveled and what had happened. But in the other Gospels, we can actually see like what he actually did oh, yeah. on the two days that he waited. So, oh, yeah, it's um, awesome. Yeah, the big revelation here is, is um, for the most part, it's assumed that John was referring to a different Lazarus. But given the timeline, it's very likely that Jesus was referring to his friend, Lazarus, in that parable that he, that, uh, that John, that Luke recorded. So in a nutshell, that Mary was upset that Lazarus, I think her brother, right? He was, yeah. he was sick and she was hoping that Jesus would have come sooner. But... Mm-hmm. You know, clearly Jesus knew what he was doing because when he was going to bring him back from the dead, it was going to be a miracle to glorify. But what's even cooler about this is that from the Luke perspective, we find out that Lazarus went to hell, essentially, and experienced. Go ahead. Well, that he that he used him, uh, that he was referring to his friend who was literally dead. Right. When he told that parable. But it's neat because in John, it doesn't really give any context about um, right. Lazarus and what happened in the meantime. So, yeah, your point is is really, really spot on. It's, it's just one of the awesome things of the Bible when you really understand it well enough to understand that these Gospels... If you read them together correctly, they're telling the same story from several different vantage points, and you're learning different information at each different gospel. So yep. I, I really enjoy this. Good, good idea on this. All right, so let's pick it up in 9. Uh, so gotcha. John eleven nine, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said. After that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to, the, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. I almost wonder if that's not a smart-ass remark, saying like, great, they want to kill us there. Let's go so that we can die with him. <laughs> yeah. No. It, it, so when Lazarus was passed for those few days... Mm-hmm. Was was he? Where did he go? Because that's one thing I'm I'm not clear about. Is was that? In the tomb. Yeah, though. Yeah, when we'll get there, it's in John 12. No, uh, uh, what I mean was, did he go to the hot place or did he go to paradise? Well, I'll tell you the. It's interesting that Jesus used him in a parable about going to Abraham's bosom. I don't think he went to the hot place. Jesus calls it Abraham's bosom, but he, he also notes that. The rich man was being tormented. Right. That, so that's where I was confused is because there was the rich. So were the rich man and Lazarus in the same place? No, different places. Okay. We'll talk okay. about, you know, we'll, we'll go into a lot more detail on that when we get to that day, because we're just, we're just going to handle what happened today. Sure. And then we'll, we'll see what, you know, where Jesus was and what he taught on the road before he rose, before he raised up Lazarus from the dead. You know, and uh, what what I might do, um, because we're going to be on this story for a little while um, this evening after we go through this, I may look at the other um, chapters of the disciples and see if I can piece together oh, their totally. story, piece together their sides also so that we can tell it from several different vantage points, because that's one of the the coolest things that... And this is something that I only figured out recently, and I know this sounds silly, but uh, it wasn't too recent that I realized that all these Gospels were telling the same story, but from mm-hmm. a different vantage point. Um, yep. 
And I should have known that a long time ago, but, um, you know, shame on me for not. But once you, once that dawns on you, it really, really makes things interesting when you start comparing um, the different Gospels to understand. Because you, like Watchful said, you learn stuff and each different disciple's Gospel about the same story, where in John it may not include things that Luke said and vice versa with uh, Matthew and whatnot. So, all right, I'm sorry to derail you. Yeah, so what's interesting here, going back to nine, he said he, he clarifies that there's 12 hours in a day because it's, it's kind of a weird shift to where, you know, he's, he's talking about um, his friend Lazarus is sick. The disciples don't quite know that he's dead yet. And he before he tells them that, that they're dead, he says, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. And we know Jesus is the light of this world. But right. if, if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after he had said them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I may, but I go that I may wake him up. So it's just an, it's an interesting aside that he makes there before he actually tells them that Lazarus is dead. Hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's continue. And I also note that this is one of the scriptures that, um, I looked to when, when I was looking at the 24 elders, trying to figure out the nup for, you know, what the scripture refers to, could be referring to in regards to the 24 elders, mm -hmm. because he makes specific note here that there are 12 hours in a day. And by order of elimination, the fact that he doesn't say that there's 12 hours in a night, uh -huh. it's common sense that one day is 24 hours, even in his day. One day right. consisted of 24 hours. Just an interesting aside yeah. there. Okay, let's continue in 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Oh, nope. Okay. So that was actually as far as we're, we're uh, to go. Um, yeah, so <laughs> this is a different day. Yeah, so when, so when he, so basically what we did here is, so from 1 to 16, mm -hmm. um, that is Nissan 4 five and six and then we'll pick up in john eleven seventeen on saturday uh, john 11 yeah so john we'll pick up actually in john eleven seven again and then look at the corresponding records that show what happened on nissan so six. that was so nissan, basically nissan four yep, five so and six nissan four five and six so today is nissan four mm -hmm. and today would have been the day that jesus found out his friend had died and then he stayed in the area of Jericho for two more days. All right. So we have the we have the insert from Luke, um, and let's see here. Are we gonna talk about this now, or are we gonna have? Kip on or Actually, what's the Kip should be calling in any minute now. That's why um, I was saying we probably don't have time to get into yeah. the details on Lazarus. But that's really fascinating what you were talking about. Isn't so cool? yeah, so we have here's Mark, and I wonder where Mark talks about this as well. Jesus It may not. Um I, yeah, I've been I've been trying to find corresponding days. Like so, I was trying to find in the Gospels where you know anything that I could find to indicate what they were doing on Nissan one and two and three. Mm -hmm. Couldn't find anything. Um, it, and Mark, I, the information that's covered is with that's it's in like within a three or four month period of time. But right. it's really interesting. Starting with the death of Lazarus, we know every single we know what he did on every single day leading up right. to his crucifixion. Man, I'm sitting here reading. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, and Kip reminded me. So what's interesting is Lazarus's death is a foreshadow of what Jesus was going to go through yeah. on the crucifixion. So this is God preparing him for what he was going to go through in just a couple of days. So we're six. Where is it? It's... Hey, guys. Six, five, four, three, oh wait, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is ten days before the crucifixion. So Lazarus died ten days before.
Jesus was crucified. Hold on, my daughter's knocking at the door. You guys can just talk. Hey, Kip. Hey, you know, one of the things that came up in the chat was when you were talking about the two names, um, and it dawned on me, ding dong, um, th that in John, he is called the one that you love. Mm -hmm. And of course, in, in Luke, he's the beggar. But what is Jesus talking about? And who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to a rich man that mm. is trying to justify himself. So he, so he casts the story in a different light than this is the guy I love. He right. casts it in, okay, there's this, this rich man and then there's this beggar. Mm -hmm. And the rich man's in hell, but the beggar, you know, and so, so that might be the reason why they don't match is because of the way that Jesus is casting the story to this rich man who's trying to justify himself. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that whole section of Luke, he's, he's, uh, sharing the whole context of Luke 18, uh, like 16 through 18 is parables. So he's, he's teaching, um, he's, this is probably what he's doing, uh, in the two days that he's in Jericho as he's, is he's teaching people. So this was part of the parables, uh, that he was using to teach. Yeah. And, and I would, I would say that most of those parables, uh, are, are true stories. Um, we could really talk another day about the, Oh yeah, uh, we're going to, we're going to go into these. I mean, like, so tomorrow's a Sabbath, but Saturday we're going to have a ton to talk about. So I plan, I'm planting the seeds here. So you guys are all prepared, get your questions prepared, and then we can do our study so that we can talk about it some more on Saturday. Yeah. Like the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, those are true stories. Those are true stories. 100%. So, um, yeah, anyway. So we tend to think of parables as something that Jesus made up, but it's uh, it's something that he says he can point to, like there's this farmer and he's casting seed. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is just like that. You know, mm -hmm. he's giving a, a picture to the people. So anyway, just thought I would throw that one out there as long as we're talking. Cool. Thanks, Cap. <sighs> So now we're going to change, we're going to move into a different segment. And what are we talking about next? Well, we're going to talk today about the hybrid agenda that has been throughout science, technology, and medicine right now. We are being mm. bombarded by a hybrid agenda. And yeah. uh, it also starts with a T. Um, yep. it's, it's that other word that we, if we say we get in trouble, but y'all know what it is. Um, so anyway, this hybrid agenda uh, has been on the earth a lot longer than you think. You know, we tend to think that this is a, a new thing, but it's it's as old, almost as old as Cain and Abel. <laughs> Even something Jesus dealt with, uh, something that Abraham and Lot dealt with, it's been around for a long time. It has been. So, and you know, it's, it's when women are turned into men, men are turned into women. Jezebel was really good at that. Jezebel... Yep. Um, she, she took the priests of the Lord and she told them, if you want to live and if you want to eat, and if you want your families to be taken care of or for them to eat, because they were, these were married men's men. Okay. You're going to live in my house. You are going to be surgically altered. Yep. You will dress as women. You will be made up as women. And that is what you will do. And that's one of the reasons why Elijah was so upset. And he thought that there were no prophets left. And uh, was it Obadiah? It was somebody with an O name had been hiding some of the true prophets and priests um, right underneath <laughs> the nose of Jezebel. Um, so he was not alone. But that is what that is what Jezebel required was was that. And of course, we know that Asherah, Ashtoreth, the uh, evil goddess that is the consort consort of Molech or ba Baal, um, mm -hmm. that is her name too. She's she's got a a hybrid men becoming women, women becoming men um, agenda that's been unleashed yeah. to this day. And if you don't believe me, look it up from Jonathan Kahn. The man has got the best downloads from the Lord, but today what we're seeing is not only that agenda you know and a lot of that goes to surgical alteration too basically what happened in those days right 
So yeah. and then we also have technology that's being implemented into the human genome through shots and implants and nanobots and things like that. So mm -hmm. surgical alterations, shots, implants, nanobots, DNA manipulation, we are right there all over again. So, so this is basically a Nephilim agenda because who are the first, the first hybrids? The Nephilim. the Nephilim. They were, yeah, they were part human, part angel, right? Well, now in this day, we have Klaus Schwab telling us that humans are going to be re engineered. And he actually said, it is you who will be changed by the Great Reset, which it was, of course, unleashed on us in 2020. But he's also got his prophet, his chief prophet, Yuval Noah Harari. And this guy is a Jew. Hi, sweetheart. You are so cute. You're so cute. So, um, anyway. She couldn't hear you because I have the earpiece is in my ear. Yeah. There They're you saying go. She can see us. She can see us waving though, right? You can say hi. <laughs> say hi. Hey. Hello. Hello. She is seven. And probably well, good at, I was good at being seven. <laughs> Kip's in the middle of a teaching, so we can't interrupt, so. So anyway, the the World Economic Forum are our would be evil overlords of the one world government. Uh, they have their own prophet and his name is Yuval Noah Harari mm -hmm. and he's a Jew and he's homosexual, openly homosexual. And um, he says that um, humans are hackable animals who will no longer possess free will and that we are set to be re-engineered. And hmm. he talked a lot about Bill Gates and hangs with Bill Gates. So I'm wondering if Bill Gates is the re-engineer. Well, you know what's interesting is that gentleman that you're talking about, he mm -hmm. is their, he is the WEF's spiritual guider. Yes. And and the um, the faith that has the red, green, and black flags with the crescent moon, their Messiah, the Mahdi, they claim that the, the gentleman you're talking about is going to be um, their spiritual guide. Um, so he could be possibly the false prophet if the Pope is not that. Okay. Interesting. Are you sure yeah. they would accept him given, given his orientation? That's a good question. But yeah. I, I've heard... There's two strikes maybe as, right there. <laughs> maybe as the peace agreement? I don't know. It's an interesting element just for consideration. I, I think how I was yeah. saying is that point taken. They, yeah. it's, a good, it's a good data point. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to know who said that and when they said it. But yeah, uh, anyway. Joel Richardson went into detail about this, but we can talk about that another time. Yeah. So, so make no mistake. We are in a seed war and it's been going on since Genesis 315 when God mm -hmm. said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, little s, and her seed, big s, he shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. So anyway, um, we know that here in the end day, in end times, Matthew 24, uh, 36 says, but on that day and hour, no one knows, but even the angels in heaven, not, not even the angels in heaven, but my father only, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the coming of man. Well, you know, I'd like to say this agenda is back, but it's not. It's never left. It's never left. It's gone underground. Um, it's gone into the shadows. It never left. So, and, you know, we do have a new Noah. You've all Noah Harari, right? So we, we do have another yep. Noah. So... <laughs> So what was the days of Noah? It was a lackadaisical attitude of humanity despite impending doom and instruction. They absolutely ignored all the warnings. Uh, wickedness across all the earth. And then there was the hybridization of humanity. So Genesis 6, 1 through 2, and then 4 is going to tell us everything we need to know. Now it came to pass when men became, began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God... Okay, those are the fallen watchers. These are these are the watchers. They were put in place to be our guides, to be uh, our God's ambassador to man. And you can read more about that in Psalms 82, right? So um, 
the sons of God, these watchers, these, these angelic beings, saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all they chose. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old, men of renown. So the Hebrew word used here for giants is Nephilim, and it literally mm -hmm. means fallen ones. So anytime that you are reading in the Bible and you see so the mighty men, the men of renown, we are talking about people with tainted bloodlines, like Og of Bashan, tainted bloodline. You know, his, his bed was gigantic, right? So, so watch for those words when you're, when you're reading scripture. So, and then Genesis 6, 9 says something very, very interesting that actually cements this and tells us that this is the truth. This is the, the narrative God is trying to get through to us. It says, Genesis 6, 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Well, we always think of his genealogy and he was perfect and he walked with God. No, he was perfect in his generations. He was perfect in his genetics. By the time that flood came around, there was almost nobody left that was not uh, some kind of uh, hybrid. And the book of Jasher tells us that um, all the righteous on the earth died before the flood so that they would not see the evil that was coming upon the earth. So hmm. you know, up there preaching and people if are I dying. Huh? If I remember correctly, isn't this word perfect the same word that's used in, in like a lamb without blemish, like a, a perfect sacrifice? Absolutely. In other words, it, mean, yes. it means with, without mixture, without blemish, without fault. And mixture is a good word. Guys, look, do a research, research the word mixture because God does not like mixture. He does not. He does not. So, uh, yeah, especially in this instance. So, right. so God killed. So, so who was, who died in the flood? It was the demonic half breeds, the giants, the mighty men. And when you read in the extra biblical apocryphal books, you find out that they were eating, they were feeding on mankind and man's blood. They had, they had decimated every other food source and they turned to eating mankind. And mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty brutal. That's pretty brutal. So, so when the flood came, God killed their bodies in the flood. But if, which lasted five months, by the way, the flood lasted five months, but the supernatural part of them, their spirit, the, the angelic part of them lived on as disembodied spirits. So a yep. Nephilim alive in its body is, is a Nephilim, a giant, a mighty man. But when it has, its body has died, it becomes a demon, a An disembodied a demon and it's look it's it's it goes nuts it's crazy to be able to find another body to inhabit so it's looking for someone who's not filled with the holy spirit that's what they're looking for so and i find it absolutely fascinating <laughs> that in um revelation 9 11 um that the the apollyon comes up this apollyon half breed apollo in in greek um mythology or history whatever you want to call it he's the half-breed son of um zeus and i can't remember who the who the mom is but he's he's a half-breed he's a demigod he's half man half angelic being okay so he get, he comes up out of the bottomless pit right and um and he's uh let's see oh and they and he they're allowed to uh torment mankind for five months I find that kind of fascinating that there's this five month period that that the the fallen angels, these watchers watch their demonic children die in the flood. And then it's like they get their their chance, their turn um, for five months to um, to torture evil men, not all men, evil men. Right. So. 
Anyway, God totally detested and destroyed Satan's hybrid race at the flood. Um, then again, when the armies of Israel moved into the promised land. Okay. So if he killed them all in the flood, how did they get back into the promised land? Nobody really knows. Um, I'm trying to remember which extra biblical book I was reading. Was it Jubilees where it made it sound like, like maybe Og of Bashan, uh, was hanging onto the side of Noah's boat. Um, hmm. but anyway, so we don't know how there's a lot of theories on how, and actually we are going to have one of the world's most amazing scholars on the Nephilim, on the fallen angelic realm. Um, on May 18th, it's going to be Ryan Peterson. If you don't know who Ryan Peterson is, look him up. He's amazing. And he might be able to answer this question for us. But, um, but God had the, had, uh, uh, well, it started with Joshua and Moses and went to David. All these all these kings, their whole job was to wipe out these Nephilim tribes, these half-breed tribes, these people who did not have pure human blood. And that's when they say, hey, even kill the animals, kill the children, kill the women. When, when they're killing all of them, you know that that's because they are not human. So they're no longer human. They're part demon. They've got tainted DNA and blood. And that's why bloodlines are such a big deal in the Bible, because then they can keep tainting, keep tainting. Their whole thought was, hey, if we taint the bloodline, there can be no Christ. There can be no baby Jesus. There can be no, no Messiah. You've promised that this Messiah is going to come. But if we taint the whole bloodline, he can't, right? And these things cannot be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. They are not redeemable at all, at all. They're they're half breeds. So the Nephilim are Satan's hybrid race, and they are absolutely making a comeback today through technology. Hmm. Yeah. So you don't so, think that there that anyone who might have like say they just have one little tiny cell of Nephilim genealogy genetics in their in their body you don't think that they're they're redeemable if they have even just one cell of nephilim dna you know i have to i have to say <laughs> that i believe in a really good god i know those who perpetrated the act are not redeemable as a matter of fact the the book of enoch tells us that they lamented and that they wanted to repent that they were and i don't know sometimes if were they truly sorry for what they did or were they sorry because they found out they were going to die like men which is again psalms 82 where god mm -hmm. tells them you are all sons of god but you will die like men you will die like men when they found that out that they were not going to be everlasting beings beings but they would die um is that why they sent enoch to go stand in the gap for them and ask god to forgive them because they did that and he said you know, oh. well the the thing is this is in my firm belief is that god can do whatever he wants mm -hmm. so it it you know it depends on the circumstances if he wants to he can do whatever uh, now he clearly said what he was going to do but i don't think anything's an impossible task for him no i think in, in the overall scheme of things that's true but he is a god of order and he's a god that never changes so you know the the whole premise of being omniscient and omnipotent is that he knows the beginning from the end there's no yeah. need to change Right. Yeah. But I mean, he yeah. he can show mercy, as we've seen oh, that sure. several times through Sodom and Gomorrah, where he changed his mind. If you found fifty righteous men, and he changed it, you know, it went all the way down to ten. But like you said, he already knew the answer ahead of time. Well, um, that's such but, a good point. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great point because you have to ask yourself. So, if he's a God who never changes, why does he change his mind? which you so you have to correlate so what what does that mean i kind of think of it like prayer to where he knows what you have need of before you ask so yeah. it's like he knows it's almost it's almost as if it's for our benefit not his 
It's so like when when we're asking him to change, he already knows what he's going to do, but he's just kind of waiting for you to get there. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 it, exactly. And that's what happened with the Sodom and Gomorrah when, um, was it Abraham that was uh, negotiating yeah, with God? Uh, for, yeah, for, not, for a lot and his family. Yeah. So, it, you know, so it, you exactly nailed it. it. God already knew that it was going to get negotiated down to 10. Um, but, you know, the flip side of the coin is like what Kip was talking about. Uh, Enoch was brought up to heaven and Enoch, you know, went to the defense of the fallen angels um, to try to plea for them uh, for their forgiveness. And God wasn't having it. Um, well, you know. well, no, because they had been in his presence. We haven't. We haven't been right. in his presence. They, they are extra guilty right. because they've, they've seen him face to face. So, mm. Well, yeah. it, it, so in the way I understand it is these watchers, they were sent here to help mankind, not turn on them. Right. Yeah. Which is, actually feel free to pull up Psalms eighty two and read it to us. Okay. Um, one of you. I can do it too, but you guys are probably faster. I'm old fashioned way over here, but I'll find it. Somewhere. Yeah, and, and in the meantime, just talking about can somebody with Nephilim blood in them be redeemed? Um I I, I listened to Blurry Creatures and they actually had a guest on that knows that they are of a Nephilim bloodline, that they believe in Jesus, they have repented on behalf of the bloodline, they they absolutely believe that they are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, most of these Nephilim bloodlines, um, there's a gal, oh, she's fascinating, Dr. Laura Sanger. Look up mm -hmm. Dr. Laura Sanger. Uh, her channel sure. is called No Longer Enslaved, and she traces Nephilim bloodlines. And our evil overlords, by and large, are from those Nephilim bloodlines. So and here's the here, well. Here's they, the caveat: is that all of these people they have souls. So even if they do have Nephilim blood, if they genuinely come to Christ and repent, they will be saved. But the thing with the the genuine Nephilim bloodline is they will not want to because of their bloodline. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they couldn't be, it's just they won't. It, that would especially be my guess. Especially if they've been raised in the worship, especially if they've been, been raised in the rituals and they have embraced the whole power and power structure. Yeah, they won't want to. So I'm in Psalm well, 82. Of, All right, go ahead. And one of the reasons, yeah, one of the reasons why, why I bring it up is there's there's special significance in yeshua's blood right mm -hmm. he didn't have the same blood as we have he had pure blood and that's what made him a perfect sacrifice a sac a lamb without blemish so it kind of makes me wonder like so we're all blemished none of us were sufficient sacrifices to be able to pay for the for the sins of mankind but he was so does that mean so where's so where's the delineating line in those who have blemish blood um, for who can be saved? That's why yeah. I'm like, if, if even if you have one strand of DNA, does that make you ineligible? Yeah, I don't know. I, I believe that God is is good and that he knows who who runs after him and who comes after him. Um, yeah. All I know is he told this specific group of, of fallen angels. No. And their Nephilim yes. sent. He told yes. them no. That is a fact. So. Because they had Enoch go petition God. Go petition yeah. for him to forgive us. And he, the answer came back, nope. Now, God could have changed his mind if he wanted to. So I don't think it has anything to do with the bloodline and them being unredeemable. The thing was this, is those specific fallen angels... They, they were made by God, so they weren't mortal men made uh, on the earth. So they didn't have souls made here on this planet. So they were not redeemable because of that. Well, now, our soul is not the part of us that that is heavenly. It's our spirit. Our soul is right. our mind, will, and emotions. 
We, mm -hmm. we so, love to say it's our soul that goes to heaven, but it's actually our spirit. Okay, right. whatever. But the, the, the point is, is the Nephilim were made by God, just like Adam and Eve were sons of God. The rest of us are sons of man, and we have spirit, soul, whatever you want to call it, from that birth. So Christ died on the cross for all of us. If we have that soul, spirit, I don't get legalistic about that. Whichever the case, if you redeem and confess, then that's it. But if you have so much of that Nephilim bloodline where you have a hate for the image of God, then you wouldn't want to. But it's the, you know, again, it's the difference is, is those, the original fallen angels, they were the sons of God. So what an option for them, which is why God was so strict with them. Oh, well, yeah. even, even Jesus declares people, you are of your father, the devil. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely those who are of their father, the devil. Yeah. yeah. And it, like, also, if you take the mark, you're not, you're not, re, you know, you're not redeemable as well, but mm -hmm. you know, that goes back to the speculation point of why, and we've talked about a variety of different reasons why, and yeah, everybody kind of has their own take. And, you know, my take is that it changes you psychologically where you won't want to be redeemed, but yeah. I'm sure there's other reasons why that once you take the mark that you cannot but that's the only thing that makes sense to me on why you could not is because you wouldn't want to be yeah. so let's look at psalms 82 and it says now it, god stands in the congregation of the mighty okay now remember we already said whenever he talks about the mighty he's talking about giants fallen angels right. all that stuff God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, little g gods, right? How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods. Now that's a little G again. You are gods. So they're sons of God. And all of you are children of the most high. So there he's saying you're sons of God. I created right. you. But you shall die like men and fall like one of their princes. So these these beings, you know, these these watchers, these angels that that fell and on purpose um, and I and Satan is a whole different person from these guys. Yeah, see that that's where a lot of people get confused is that these two hundred watchers. That's a totally different group than when Satan and his third of the angels got casted out. Yeah, because and they were they, they were sent here. Somehow, maybe, but we're, that's a question for Brian Ryan Peterson. <laughs> So, but, see, well, you, you know, know, think about it for a second, though. The the watchers, the fallen angels, they weren't part of that crowd that's referenced in Revelation. They were sent here to watch over man. The, the 200 of them came down on Mount Hermon and were sent here to protect and teach mankind, not turn on them. So but they did. Exactly. And that's why they got condemned. But the only point I was making was, is, is clearly there's another storyline uh, for Lucifer and a third of his angels, which would be great to at some point speculate the difference between those two groups, because it's pretty clear that it's two different groups that they're that we're talking about. And who knows, they might have joined forces, but again, Ryan Peterson's coming on really soon. And I yeah, that's going to be has really interesting. Because I don't have one. I don't have one. But I can tell you that transhumanism is a really big deal right now in our society. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It is, yeah, it is happening right before our eyes. Um, and, and transhumanism is the counterfeit of what God offers. It's a counterfeit. Um 
it, it's using technology to replace the Holy Spirit. So, and this, this concept goes clear back to, to the Tower of Babel and, and Nimrod. And they had great technology in those days. And it was given to them by the fallen angelic beings, the watchers. Right. You know, that's where they got it. We all know that. Um, that's not a secret. Um, we even see genetic technology in the Bible. So First Chronicles 1.10 says, Cush begot Nimrod, and Nimrod began to be a mighty man on the earth. Hmm. Uh, the the, the men, word yeah. used there for mighty man is a gibberim. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, um, yeah, he be he began to to be a a half breed. Now, how how could he do that? Was there some kind of was it a blood transfusion? Was it was it some kind well, of a a blood ritual? Was there? Well, that's a good question. We don't know, but it's weird that a man can a man can become a gibberim or a mighty man, a nephilim, a half breed. Yeah. And, you know, that that all goes back to how did they survive the flood? You know, because there's a debate on that. Did Was there more that came down or did they exit with technology? But it, it was clear, though, that they did because later on in, like, Exodus, when they, the Israelites make it to the land of milk and honey they're fighting giants there they're as well thriving. they're thriving so um you know it's funny because now that i think about it there's nothing in scripture that tells us what happened to those sons of god right so maybe so, they but, just kept doing what they were doing i don't know but, well, um, it's it's interesting to speculate how they repopulated mm -hmm. uh, i guess is all i was getting at because there's there's different avenues that you can consider did god not get them all in the flood or you know did they did they have this technology that allowed them to you know did they have submarines that they were you know you never know yeah. um but it, it was clear that god said that everything died you know all the birds everything the only thing that survived was Noah and his family and the animals that he took on the boat. So, I mean, yeah, no, some do you not speculate? One of the wives, some believe one of the wives might have been um, yeah, right. the tainted bloodline, but we don't know. We don't know. There's there's some, there's speculation about all of this, um, but the bottom line is uh, they're here. <laughs> they're yeah, here. No yep. matter how they got here, they're here. So and. Uh, you know, it's, I find it really funny that uh, the dark side knows all this, has known all this, and they put it in our movies and stuff. I mean, think about the, uh, the word gibberine, right? Did a quick Google search and came up with Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics has a, it has, has a, uh, video games, this gibberine video game series. Um, and they are a race of extraterrestrials, and we know that the the Nephilim are are in this age are going to make their comeback as aliens. We know that that's what these extraterrestrials are. They're not extraterrestrials; they're interdimensionals. They are literally half breeds. Um, anyway, they are a race of extraterrestrials who have super long life, and in their gaming series, they even have. A, a game called Church of the Gibberine. Yeah. Really? So, giants, yeah, and I was looking at some of the, the graphics that go with it. They're giants. They have six fingers. They have six toes. They're half animal hmm. and half animal. Really? So, now, the, the six fingers and the six toes. So 2 Samuel 20, uh, 21, 20 says, Yet again, there was a war at Gath. Now, remember, Goliath's home was Gath. Goliath the giant was from Gath. Where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he was also born to the giant. So six fingers, six toes, 
that is a, a sign of Nephilim. Now, I find this fascinating, guys. In using AI technology to uh, make pictures, right? Has anybody ever noticed that one of the things that AI has the hardest time with is hands? It how does. Many, how many times does the hand have six fingers? It does. <laughs> Oh, I never when thought about that. The Palestinian boy and his his dead mother with the with the blood all over her face, and he had six fingers, so he was AI generated. Hmm. It was all over the place. It was so funny. It like went worldwide, and then somebody says, "Hey, how's this kid get six fingers?" Oop, then the picture gets taken back. Yeah. So, yeah, it does that a lot. So really, look at fingers. Um, and I would tell you that AI is is demonically charged. It is demonically um, uh, controlled. And so there's no doubt in my mind that that's why there would be six fingers. Oh, absolutely. Call me crazy. Call me crazy. Yeah. But, you know, there's the transhumanism has three supers, right? Um, and this is what they're going to do. They are going to sell this this hybrid agenda to our children and to us. They're going to try and sell it to us as, as, oh, get your superpower. Get your superpower on, guys. So what are the three supers of transhumanism? The first one is health. The first one is health. And what is that? That's replacing the Holy Spirit. The next one is longevity. That's replacing eternal life. And then the other one is super intelligence. Well, that's replacing the mind of Christ right? So it is a total counterfeit of what God offers. But that those are the three things that they're going to offer us as our superpowers, health, longevity, intelligence, all this, the superpower of the mind. So I've kind of thought about this. And I know, no. <laughs> I know, I know. So, um, now, an IQ of 140 and above is considered to be a genius. But if you get a chip, an implant, a, a one of Elon Musk's ports, and you download information into your brain, you can actually upgrade with a computer chip so that your brain will increase your intelligence up to like 1,000 IQ. So, But if you don't get the upgraded chip, you will become unemployable. Your kids are unable to go to school because they can't keep up. They, they can't learn. So, so if, if people do not take these implants and things that they have planned for us, you will become a subclass, just like, you know, wow. jabbed versus unjabbed. You know, how, how you can't go to the store and you can't go here and you can't go there. So... So that is one of the way, the ways that they could obviously sell some of this technology to Well, men. yeah. Well, think about it. You mm -hmm. know, it's common, common knowledge and practice that right now mankind can use roughly 10% of their brain. What if this technology unlocks the other 90%? And you're right this would create a new class of humans that would be f far superior to the original mankind. And yeah. it would literally at some point render them extinct because the, you would not be able to maneuver against them or war against them or really anything. He, he yeah. would literally have to have God's intervention in order to protect yourself. That um, that ten percent thing is actually a myth that has been long since debunked. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. James Tour does a really good talk on that because it comes up quite often because he is one of the world's foremost authorities on the brain and also nanobots too. He's also the world's foremost authority on micro machines at the at the nanoscopic scale. I bet you we could get him on the show. That would be a really interesting guy to get on here to talk about Nephilim, the uh, the mark of the beast, those microchips, what's capable with, you know, at scale, at microscopic scale, because that's literally what he does. He's got he owns like 50 companies and thousands of patents 
on all that technology. Um, yeah, I, but yeah, the the brain is um, there was there was some study that was done that has been completely debunked that talked about that ten percent. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, it's been completely debunked. We actually yeah, it, use like one hundred percent of our brain. Okay, so that being said, it, Kip's point was still very relevant. If sure you can chip yourself and increase your processing speed and and storage capacity and accessibility to knowledge and all that stuff, it would still create a a new class of and it's it's just interesting how it all ties together. Yeah, yeah. it's a fact I, that we're going down that path given the trajectory of technology. Does the yeah. Bible does the Bible literally talk about this transhumanism in a way? Well, with the Nephilim, yes. It does. And then we've got this mark of the beast. You know, what is this thing? It's we know that the word mark means etching. Right. And it's in the skin or under the skin. So there is some kind of technology to that. So do we know what it is? Not yet. We've got a lot of candidates. And I'll tell you what, I absolutely believe that we will know what it is. We cannot be tricked into it because it's going to come with with worship and it's going to come with an oath of fealty. We will know exactly what we were doing. Our God plays fair, even though the enemy doesn't. And he, and he will make sure that we are not tricked. I mean, a lot of people were tricked into the the, yeah. the medicine, into the medicine. Mm. They, they didn't know. Um, uh, we will absolutely know. Yeah. When it's I, I, time in the line. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm sticking to my uh, concept. I know that you guys have your own as well, but just hearing from the several prophetic guys that we've had on here that have literally seen it in their visions, I'm I'm sticking with the technology chip. But uh, it'd be great to see more, um, you know, perspectives and and theories, and then. You know, eventually we will see uh, which one is correct. Yeah. No, it's funny because, um, and I, oh, gosh, it was Linda, somebody from Google, who was talking about her, um, they were making um, tattoos. They were making tattoos that you could put on your arm and it would it would sink into your arm. So that's poss a possibility that literally etches into you. So and she ha 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 calling it a, her wearable. Oh, it's hmm. just going to be like wearable technology. We just put on it. Oh, and I was like, mm, no, <laughs> no, not at all. So but, but, you know, when we're talking about this kind of stuff, look for terms like post-human society, transhuman. Yeah. Them. Human 2.0 is another way that they'll sell it. Oh, it's Human 2.0. Yeah, that no, no, the no, no, four. How do you pronounce his name from the WEF? Uh, Narora. Uh, Yuval, Yuval Noah Baldi. Harari. Yeah, that's what he says. Is they they're creating a new class of people that you know the the traditional all biological. Um, human will be obsolete in so many years. You know, it's funny because the last time I saw him, because remember when we first saw him, he was like, you know, humans are hackable animals. And, rah, 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 rah. and this last time I saw him in something, I, I got the sense from how he said things and what he said that he is really burdened by this, that he mean? is starting to see how destructive it is. I got the, the sense that when he was talking about it, he was almost sorry that this is what is happening and he doesn't know how to to um, to walk it back. It was hmm. really weird. I can't remember who I was watching with and I thought, huh, this is odd because this isn't the guy that normally is so certain about what he says and almost gleeful in it. This man sounds remorseful for the things he's saying. And so maybe if, he's waking up and going, ah, uh, what have I done? I hope well, so. What if, what if God has removed those blinders? I hope so. Because I hope so. That's, doing a lot that, of damage. Well, you know, if you think about it, that's exactly what it is. You have 
all these men in power with their narrative and their agenda that truly believe what they're doing. The, it, it, they mm-hmm. are under a mass delusion from the enemy. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes you wonder if, like, the, the man you're talking about, he's, you know, sometimes God will remove the blinders just for a temporary amount of time, giving you an opportunity to repent and make things right. And I, mm-hmm. I wonder if that opportunity is presented and if he will make things right, um, that's that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you can only hope because I, I would not wish hell on my worst enemy. Yeah. So we've mm-hmm. got Elon Musk and Neuralink, which is a, a USB port into your brain. So you can upload to the cloud. You can download to the cloud, those kind of things. There's also a company called BlackRock Neurotech. Imagine that, BlackRock hmm. Neurotech. And they're all about interfacing and engineering with the brain. And then um, also Google's chief engineer, uh, a man by the name of Ray Kurzweil, he's known as a futurist. Um, And he predicted that humans will be hybrids by 2030. So, and then I found this really amazing article called Opening the Brain Gate. And of course, I thought that was funny, Brain Gate, Bill Gates, who knows? But mm-hmm. check this out. I'll read it to you. Scientists have combined artificial intelligence and a brain computer interface to help a paralyzed man translate his imagined handwriting into actual text. So this guy's thinking about what an A looks like, and the computer is making an A for him, right? Okay. Oh, wow. Yes. No. So this was reported in Nature magazine in 2021 in the May 12th edition. So this is a couple of years ago and this will blow your mind, even though it's a couple of years old. The man concentrated as if he were writing. He was effectively thinking about making the letters with imaginary pen and paper. As he did this, electrodes implanted in his motor cortex recorded the signals which were then interpreted by algorithms running on an external computer, decoding his imaginary pen trajectories, which mentally traced the 26 letters of the alphabet and some basic punctuation marks. In other words, the system used electrodes implanted in his brain to interpret neural activity, decode the imagined letters, and use them to create rapid and ap- rapid and accurate so think about that rapid and accurate like real time text he wrote 90 characters or 18 words in one minute with 94 percent accuracy using only his imagination well think about where that technology is now mm-hmm. they're, they only doing show us for... what they had 50 years ago yeah they've been doing that for i'm aware of it like even when i was a childhood we had toys that like had this thing you'd stick on your head and you Mm -hmm. could fly a little drone uh just with your thoughts you could basically make it go up and down they still have them today you can look them up they're like some it's a really simple um they they, they've known that they can actually read the brain waves outside of the skull and they've had the technology for 20 or 30 years like commercially available uh for little things like that that you know uh, but it's gotten more advanced. Toy? How did I not uh, have this toy? I, 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 I had one. It was really, <laughs> it was really dumb. Basically, basically, what you could do is you could you could get it to fly, and then as you moved your head around, it moved. So, but mm-hmm. it's been around, yeah. And yeah. Um, but Bill Gates is a um, has he, he's had a company that has had the implant for like ten or fifteen years. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't have the same resolution as Elon's. Elon's is is revolutionary because of the amount of wires that are in the head. But mm-hmm. you're right. The the fear right now it's read only. The fear is is what happens when it com- when you can write to the brain when you can download information. Um, what's yeah. what are the possibilities? What are the capabilities? Are they able to control the will? Are they able to download your your soul? Are they able to replace your soul? It's like. A lot of big yeah. question marks. Can they take your free will? Can they right. can they download memories and thoughts that aren't yours? Can they right. take your can they upload your memories and thoughts and replace them with something else? I mean there's there's a lot of questions. It's kind of scary stuff. Yep. So let's look at Genesis eleven, five through six really quick. Um, 
This is about the Tower of Babel, where we know that they had incredible technology. Incredible technology. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing they propose or imagine uh, to do will be withheld from them. So think about this one language. Personally, I believe that the entire world does speak one language again, and that language is computer code. Find me, find me a place where they, where you don't have people speak in computer. We, we use our computers every day. We don't even know we're using code, but we do. I believe that we are back to that Tower of Babel again. So, yeah. So that's we're what's going on. Able, we're definitely able to communicate. There's no barrier, even if yeah. you don't know the language. In fact, I was literally watching somebody do a, um, a, a Bible study to where the, the man leading the study did not speak French, but he had his phone with Google Babel on it, listening to people that were sharing the scripture and it was just translating word for word what he was saying in real time. So there's no longer a barrier of language. Even if you don't know the language, you still have the means by which to communicate. So we're oh, definitely yeah. back to this point in time to where no nothing that we can imagine will be withheld from us. And you know, it's funny because we, we read about the Rosetta Stone that supposedly had all the different languages on it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and but I don't remember what it is. Let me see if I can look it up. The Rosetta Stone, what it actually says. I think it um, had three languages. It was like Sumerian, Greek, and something else. And it was it, it gave them a language that they were aware of that, uh, that had the same passage, the same thing written on three sides so that they were able to actually identify what characters in this long forgotten language um, meant, which unlocked, was it hieroglyphs? The, the Egyptian hieroglyphs. I can't remember what it did, but yeah. What is the written passage on the, well, gosh, where is it? I, I looked it up one day and, and it's, uh, it's about, uh, one of the Greek, uh, Kings or, uh, Ptolemy the fifth, maybe it, maybe Ptolemy. Ptolemy is a, uh, Egyptian Pharaoh. Um, uh, it says the God who maketh himself manifest, whose deeds are beautiful. I mean, it's basically big time propaganda is what the Rosetta Stone actually is written on it is about some Egyptian guy being God. So, yeah, it's it's craziness is what it is. But, um, yeah. So, guys, look that up. Look that up. What is written on the Rosetta Stone? Because I think that's just as important as the, the Rosetta Stone was found, and it supposedly has these different languages. And But, yeah. I, in the videos on my channel, I actually talk a lot about the Rosetta Stone because the, uh, the Revelation 12 sign, in a mm -hmm. lot of ways, is very similar to a Rosetta Stone for us because it is an anchor point in time by which we can, we can now uh, reverse engineer meaning. And, you know, we can we have a point in time that matches the scripture that, that has, you know, has written about it for for millennia. That's talked about this one particular wonder in heaven. And then when that wonder in heaven actually happens, we have that anchor point. The Rosetta Stone did the same thing uh, to where there was a lost language in like Egyptian hieroglyphics. Like we had no idea what the pictures meant. But when they found the Rosetta Stone and they could see the hieroglyphics written about this one guy, and it was also written in Greek, they could say, oh, this is what those pictures must mean. So it basically yeah. gave them that missing piece so that they could begin to reverse engineer the meaning of the pictures. Well, we can do the same thing with the heavens. We have this one point in time and what it meant, and it's associated with a, a period of time where we're living. So now we can take the information surrounding that and begin to reverse engineer the meaning of things. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense too. But again, I would argue that we speak one language and it's computer code. Now think about it. When the Holy spirit came, we restored the languages. So he did. We, we now can speak in tongues. 
Mm. You know, if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues, not everybody does. And I, I'll be the first person to tell you that. And it is not a mark of being more spiritual or better or whatever, uh, saved and unsaved. Um, it is a gift and not everybody has all the same gifts. But those who speak in tongues and God, God restored the languages so that we can speak and somebody in whose German can understand us because he's using us to speak to them. So, so God did restore the languages at, at uh, Pentecost. But still, um, right now, my money is on computer code um, as the devils come back of, of the, the lost languages, the, the mixing up of the languages. So, but yeah, we've got CRISPR gene splicing, you know, um, and gene splicing is really weird. I mean, think about it like a movie where you're just taking certain scenes out and then you're putting the whole thing back together. You know, if you, if you're trying, if you've taken this, this strand of DNA and you're trying to snip out cancer, um, what else are you taking out with that? You just don't know, you know, now a Chinese doctor has used it to uh, treat lung cancer, um, kidney and liver disease, stuff like that. Um, but again, what codes are you taking out? Because it's not like you can just snip out this little piece of cancer. You've got to take out a bigger piece. So, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of scary stuff. So and they do it a lot in uh, pigs. Surprisingly, they use pigs. Uh, to do that. And the other thing about pigs, you know, um, most of us probably know somebody who has had a, a sphincter in their heart or even a pig heart transplant. Why is it always a pig? Well, because they've got the closest match in DNA to human beings. Hmm. Not monkeys, not chimps or apes, like we were, have always been told. The closest DNA match to humans is pigs. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, and then there's things called chimeras, right? And that's that's what these gene edited pigs are. Um, a chimera is a hybrid um, where they where um, Jane needs a new heart. So doctors take a DNA sample from Jane and they inject it into a pig embryo. And this pig embryo grows a human heart with Jane's DNA. And scientists then kill that pig to get Jane's new heart. And that sounds all awesome. But if this pig is growing a human heart, what else is he growing that's human? A brain, uh, a stomach, what, what else is he growing that's human? And, and you know, it kind of reminds me of Jurassic Park. You know, how do you control this? You know, um, there's a big dilemma. Exactly what are you making? How do you control it? Um, and is it humane to grow an animal? Um, or is it even, you know, think about it, cloning people. Uh, is it humane to clone a person just to get a kidney for their match so that their kidney, their, their match or whoever they, I mean, is that humane? Wouldn't that have a soul and a, a spirit, wouldn't it? I mean, that's, those are good questions. We don't know. Yep. I think that's yeah. why they're trying to grow the individual organs to avoid that argument where if they figure if it's not in a body, if it's just a lung, then it's free. Oh, they're not, they're not trying. They have. Yeah. yeah, they have, but it's still a lot easier to grow the whole pig. Not just <laughs> and so that's what they do. And, and again, we know that this technology is what what they tell us is you know 50 years ago so yeah they're they're well past the things that we can talk about tonight so yeah and then there's hybridization you know genetically altering plants cattle hey all the way back in uh, 2015 the uh the food and uh the food and drug administration who who does food the f the fda Somebody here in America okayed frankenfish, which is this super meaty, muscular salmon, um, and it was okayed for human dis consumption. And it's it's a hybrid. It's yeah, a hybrid. Uh, fish. Speaking of which, um, I haven't confirmed this yet, but uh, one of our 
listeners sent me some articles of a new engineered uh, meat that they're using uh, human cells in the design for some reason, and they they link it to um, they link it to you know prepping for cannibalism, which was really odd. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I. You can't make this stuff up. Um, you know, it's funny because I just remember the movie, The Terminator. Mm-hmm. And remember the guy that found the hand, the scientist, and he was so excited because of everything that they were going to do and how great it was going to be. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute. I uh, didn't think about all the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times these scientists are so excited about what they can do. They don't think about the ramifications of it, you know, and they're devastating. Yeah. They are devastating. So, and we do know that, that animals, you know, cause, cause Bill Gates has got his, his fake meat, which amazes me guys. If you look into how they make this fake meat, they do use cells, but then they have to have all this blood to, to put these cells in so that they can grow. Okay. Well, so then you had to kill the cow. Why don't you just eat the meat <laughs> instead of doing his blood and use it to make fake meat? It, just, it makes no sense. Well, they, they justify it as the animal's flatulence is a form of uh, a carbon footprint that mm-hmm. is warming. degrading the environment. But we all know that that's a scam. It's all oh, about yeah. control. It's mm-hmm. all about control. Once they have control over the, the crops, and the animals and everything is genetically engineered by them, then they use food as a weapon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the easiest way to get people to comply. Mm-hmm. Starvation, yeah. yeah. Well, Jasher 4, 18 through 19 says, And their judges and rulers, which are the sons of men or the watchers, went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force and their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field and the fowl of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in Hmm. order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all the flesh was corrupting, had corrupted its ways upon the earth all men and all animals. So when we talk about these these hybrids, the Nephilim, we're talking about unbelievable beasts. Uh, uh, like the the Hivites in the in the Bible. If you look at the Hivites or Hivites, they were known as the buzzing ones. Were were they somehow connected to bees or wasps? You know, there's the lion-faced men that are spoken about in the Bible. I mean, we're, we're talking about, I mean, are we talking about Bigfoot? Are we talking about Mothman? Are we talking about uh, vampires? Half bat, half man needs to feed on blood. Are we talking about werewolves? Are all of the things that we have, have uh, been brought up to think are just myth or story, are those things real? And is there worse? There obviously is way, way worse. So, and Hollywood has been telling us all about this for years and they've been doing it with uncanny accuracy, of course. So, um, do they see the future or do they have the same dark Lord as our scientists? <coughs> because when you look like, let's just, let's just throw out the Marvel comic universe, right? Now we already talked about their gibberim, uh, video game series. Well, stop and think about this transhuman or hybrid mixture agenda. Think about Captain America. You know, Steve Rogers is injected with a serum that gives him super strength. You know, he doesn't age, he doesn't die. Iron Man is a super scientist and he interfaces with a power cell that gives him everlasting life. You know, until he takes it out, you know. But, and he makes a flying iron suit Uh, that interfaces with his brain to do whatever he wants. And, you know, the computer link is Jarvis. Um, Captain Marvel, she's infused with nuclear power and becomes invincible. Spider-Man, 
You know, Peter Parker is bitten by a radioactive spider and he gets his superpowers. Even the X-Men, they're mutants. They're genetically altered. They're animals and angels. If you take a good look at what them, they are, they're animal and angel. You know, the fly is the ultimate trans tale, the fly. I mean, this movie scared me to death when I was a kid. Um, Jeff Goldblum's character, um, Seth Brundle, uh, he's testing out teleportation. And as he gets in this teleportation machine, this fly gets in with him and mixes DNA. And and there's even, and this is gross, This there's even a romantic component to that movie. Uh, like... Does that go back to the whole Nephilim hybrid taking the sons? Ugh, ugh, ugh. So anyway, um, so our movies have been telling us for a long time that this stuff is real and it's true and that science is doing it, that science is behind all of this. And it's, it's right there in the Marvel comic superheroes. So, and that, that brings us to the subject of super soldiers. You know, um, uh, China, Russia, and the U.S. are actually in an arms race and have been for a very long time. This is not new information, but, uh, you know, stuff that people just need to bring back up again in their thinking. Um, there's an arms race to create a lethal super soldier. And even uh, Vlad Vladimir Putin, when he was at the 19th World Festival of Youth, you know, I, he was talking to a bunch of students in Sochi. And he warned of the dangers of, of governments playing God with the genetic code. And he says that human beings being genetically immune to uh, be, being genetically engineered to be immune to pain and fear that they would actually be more powerful than a nuclear bomb. Wow. Yeah. And, and he admitted that the U.S. and China are ahead of Russia on this game. But he, he warned them, he said, he warned them that this is an awful game to play. It's an awful game to play. And that, that goes to DARPA, you know. Um, DARPA is a U.S. military arm that's working on super soldiers. Um, and it started with the TNT program uh, to make, and, and it's, it, they're making kind of like a halo styled super soldiers that can run at Olympic speeds. They can go days without food. They heal at accelerated rates and uh, they can carry enough gear to make a bodybuilder cry like a baby. You know, how, how are they doing that? Well, one way is through computer interfaces and brain chips. Um, and then they're also replicating genetic anomalies. Like there are people on the planet that don't feel pain, that they have super strong bones. I mean, guys, remember the movie uh, Unbreakable with Bruce mm -hmm. Willis? Yeah. I mean, they literally go out and they're looking for Bruce Willis. They told us in the movie. And what does the evil guy like to draw? Superheroes. That's what the evil, uh, what's his name? That Jackson guy. Oh, Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson's character. What does he draw? He draws these super these superheroes, and uh, and he found Bruce Willis who doesn't break bones, doesn't get sick, you know. Yeah, that's what he's looking for. That's what they're looking for. They go all over the world and they take genetic samples from people that have all kinds of of weird anomalies, like they don't feel pain or they don't need sleep. Um, and they're even doing genetic alterations like to intestines so that they can digest cellulose. They can just eat grass. So right now a human being cannot eat grass for very long before they make themselves really sick. As a matter of fact, you'll get um, big stomach worms from eating grass. Um, yeah, because we're not meant to, to eat grass. So, and I think it's funny because when Nebuchadnezzar went mad and if you look that up, guys, if you look up Nebuchadnezzar, when um, when God judged him for those seven years, actually, God didn't judge him. Look it up. His punishment came from the watchers and his punishment was to become a Nephilim. He became half man, half animal out of his mind for seven years. 
that was his judgment. Look it up, guys. It's it's true. So, yeah. So, uh, and, and Nebuchadnezzar ate grass. That's what he ate. But we're not meant to do that. Grass? So, mm -hmm. huh? Oof. Yeah, get, pretty like, crazy. Blades of grass? Blades of grass. You d don't eat grass for very long. We, we can't digest it. And so that's why they're, they're trying to genetically alter um, stomachs and intestines so that they can. So that this super soldier, it, can, it doesn't need any sleep. It runs really fast. It can carry heavy loads. It doesn't have any fear. Um, I mean, it's the perfect weapon. And you don't even have to feed it. It can just eat grass. Hmm. You don't get to feed this thing. So, and, and here's where it gets really scary. Um, they are actually genetically splicing uh, memories and dreams out of PTSD victims. So people who in, in the military have severe PTSD, they, they have a special portion of the program where they are altering their dreams. They are giving them new thoughts. I mean, we've, we've all seen it in The Born Identity. I mean, the movies tell us what they've been doing for years. And it's very true. If they can ge genetically splice or upload your memories, your dreams, and download something else to them, can they upload your free will? Can they make you believe that there is no God? There, can, can they block that portion of your spirit? That's a really that would good be a really good question for Dr. James Tour, because that is yeah. his specialty. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. What are their capabilities? What can and can't be done? Because he was he uh, he was actually an atheist, and it was through his study of the brain that he realized there was a god. Because he they mm -hmm. had hired him uh, to actually make a mechanical brain, and it was during that process that he discovered we are created beings. I bet that came down to irreducible complexity. Um, that's, that is uh, one of the things that science has always, ha has always said, and, and especially, um, oh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, if you can get down to a point where, where even the smallest piece of the smallest cell, if it breaks, the whole thing breaks, mm -hmm. then that means that it c cannot um, evolve, that it's not evolving and getting better, that if it gets down to the very smallest thing and if it breaks, everything breaks, well, then that means that there's irreducible complexity, that, that it doesn't evolve to get better, it actually breaks down, which means that there is a God in heaven. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah so irreducible complexity is a big deal. It's really interesting following his talks. He's currently he currently has laid down the gauntlet for the scientific community uh, to prove evolution. So as a peer None. who understands everything they understand, he's basically calling out their lies and saying, prove it. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, many have tried and they all just try to manipulate. None of them have actually been able to successfully prove their theories uh it's just like the simplest cell like we cannot replicate the simplest mm -hmm. carbohydrate the simplest sugar cell we can't if we're given the ingredients and we're given the circumstances we cannot put them together and make even the simplest of cells yeah. so. the very smallest thing they can find within a, a cell is this little flagellum it goes around and around and around it's like a little rotor and it pushes these amino acids around. If that thing breaks, the whole cell dies. Yeah. It's gone. So, and that's the thing. Evolution assumes or, or that things are getting better and better and better. They're not. Um, we know just by watching everything around this earth that it denigrates. It gets worse and worse and worse. Nothing is getting better. But that's that's the the whole point of evolution is that you're you're progressing and no 
Humankind is not progressing. We're getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and we're living shorter and shorter and shorter. And the only reason that we have a longer lifespan now is because of artificial means. So, yeah, it's evolution is the biggest lie there ever was. I mean, the, yeah. the laws of thermodynamics, um, you know, if you if you leave a house, you, you build a house and you leave it there for 30 years and you come back, it's not going to be a nicer house. It's not going to turn into a castle. It's going to be. No, a level. You'll be lucky if it's livable. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, so yeah. So evolution. Even, even look at all, look at these look at these multi million dollar mansions that are literally made out of granite and stone. You know, five and ten years left unmaintained, they're they're in shambles. They're literally <laughs> crumbling. Yep, yep. And so this this all plays into the mark of the beast in some way, shape, or form. Which way we don't know. We're gonna find out. We will all we we will see it with our own eyes. I hope not. I hope we don't. But if we do, we will know. Right. We'll absolutely know that that it's uh, and it says he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that mark is an etching. However, that goes. We know that they have tattoos that etch down into the skin. We know all kinds of things. Um, that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast and the number of his name. It's all about monetary control. Um, you know, stop and think about this. What is the ultimate end game of the mark of the beast? Yes, monetary control. But I would, I would tell you guys the ultimate end game is hive mentality. It's a hive mentality. Well, it's, yeah, that's how they'll control. It's the Borg. It's seven of nine. It's you no longer have free will. You are their slave. You have signed up for slavery and you do what you're told. You are no longer an individual. You are just like in Star Trek, the seven of it's, nine of Borg. It's, that's why you're not redeemable because you won't want to be redeemed. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's and, literally taken your free will. Well, yeah, it's, it's replaced it with a piece of technology. Yeah. Um, just like many stories we've heard from folks like uh, Steve. I can't say his last name, that Pastor Steve. Um, several folks in their visions that see the mark of the beast and the way it the way it rolls out where folks literally see their family executed and they they display no emotion from it mm -hmm. once because they had been chipped right before it um and that's what it will do and like you said it will be a hive mind mentality because they will work together to hunt down the rest that are not oh yeah yes yes they will so and that's and that's what the borg in star trek does they're literally just taking over uh, planet after planet, people after people, and stop and think about the Borg ship. Okay, it's this big cube flying through space. Isn't that weird? I mean, aren't most in most shows the the ship is some kind of saucer or it has a, a saucer on it, kind of like a, the SS Enterprise is the saucer with the little thing sticking back. Um, but this is a flying cube. I mean, it's just what is that? It's an exact replica of the New Jerusalem. When when the New Jerusalem comes down um, in Jerusalem, Israel, people are going to be scared to death because they've been conditioned to believe that that's that those are the bad guys. Those are the Borg. Yeah, that's what they've done is they've they've turned that narrative around in Star Trek to make it look like the New Jerusalem is the is the bad guys when it's really Jesus coming back to say, no, 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 I'm running this show now. You're going to see what righteousness and justice is all about. So, yeah. yeah. So the mark, and when you take the mark, it's an unforgivable sin. It's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You deny that God or the Spirit exists. And it's kind of like Esau. You know, Esau sold his birthright. And the Bible says that God despised him for that. 
He despised him for that. He willingly exchanged the Holy Spirit for a cheap imitation and thus became unsavable. We cannot do that, guys. We cannot do that. And then one more thing I'll throw out there for you that that kind of upholds this transhumanism um, model that we've been talking about is Daniel 237, that, that big statue um, that, that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about, and he, he didn't know how to interpret it. And yes, there are lots of, of layers of revelation to this. I know that in the chat, somebody's going to say, Kip, those are nations. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. But so Daniel 237, you know, first it starts out talking about the head of gold, which is Babylon. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, Nebuchadnezzar. He has made you ruler of them all. You are the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, Medo-Persia, right? Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which is Greece, which shall rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, right, shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partially of potter's clay and partially of iron, the last, these kingdoms shall be divided, you know, and, and there's a really good case to make for these 10 toes um, of these, of this mixture that it could be the 10 nations surrounding Israel. It could also be the 10 nations of Europe. Okay. There's, there's some, some possibilities there, but, Anyway, we are talking in in this manifestation, we are talking about actual nations. But then it says something kind of funny. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they, who's they? What? What? Who's they all of a sudden? They will mingle with the seed of men and they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now we know that the kingdom that shall never be destroyed has not been set up yet. So this last part is weirdly something other than this statue and these seven kingdoms and the the ten kingdoms it's clearly something else it's talking about iron mixed with clay they will mingle with the seed of men and they will not it's talking about nephilim half breeds right there in the end days because we know that this kingdom that shall not be destroyed has not been set up right so then when we go into Revelation 13, you know, well, um, the 10 toes in Daniel are the same thing as the 10 horns in Revelation. Revelation 13, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising out of the sea having seven heads and 10 horns. And on those 10 horns, 10 crowns. Um, Daniel 7.24 also talks about the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from the kingdom, and another shall rise after them, and he shall subdue three kings. So we've got these ten horns there. Revelation 17.12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Personally, I I hate I hate to interrupt you, but I have to be somewhere and I'm going to be late. I got to bounce off right now. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, You guys don't forget to go sign up on the social network. YouTube is persecuting us. So if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, go sign up on the social network. Thank you so much, Kip. Later, Chris. Take care, guys.
where did everybody go? <laughs> I was getting something and I heard everybody had to bounce. Um, all right. I was just getting more coffee. Um, so, um, what should we do now? It is, I come back and it's just me. Shall we read? What shall we read? I come back and everybody is gone. That was actually pretty funny. I was like, I heard in my ear that they were all leaving. I'm like, oh no. Oh no. So, I am going to read. I was looking at a couple good chapters. Um, I kind of got lost in um, uh, Kip's presentation, so please forgive me. So, um, call Kip Chris. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I was kind of getting lost in all of it anyways. So, um, so when she was talking about the Nephilim, the, there's a couple chapters that I was thinking of because in Numbers 13, there is, um, you guys really want me to call Kip? What do you want me to do here? You, someone else can call Kip and tell her to call back. Um, I'm good with whatever. All right, I'll call Kip. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Hey, this is Kip. Sorry I missed your call, but leave me a message and I will get back. Oh, there you are. I was wondering where you went. Well, I, I thought the show was over the way that Watchful was talking. You weren't there, and it made it sound like he was... I was just getting coffee. I went oh, to get coffee, yeah, I and know. I come back, and it's just me. I got I was confused. Like, <laughs> I'm like, uh, what just happened? Um, yeah. My yeah, coffee? Off, and he said goodbye, and it made it sound like it was goodbye for everybody. Oh, no. I control the stream. Uh, the stream oh, is right. on until I hit end. Um, well, I was... I was confused. I'm old. That, that's I was I really to confused. I, I went to get, I, I, I held up my coffee cup to mean I was going to go get coffee. And then I was in there and I'm like, why is everybody bailing? Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the viewers were like, call Kit back. So here we are. Okay, guys, I'm back. Um, but yeah, so when we look at Daniel, we know that, that Daniel and revelation come together they're telling the same story they have a lot of the same imagery um and those horns those horns are are these you know i personally i believe in revelation 17 12 the 10 horns um that are the kings who have received no kingdom as of yet personally i'm going to take a, a stab at this i'm going to i'm going to see are these multinational corporations because right now there are 16 corporations that run everything in the entire world. Um, it would only take a few mergers uh, or a buyout to get that down to 10. And um, the other thing that it could be are zones like the Hunger Games. So, but, you know, it talks about these, these 10 kings, right, who have no kingdoms as of yet. So that's what those horns are. Um, Revelation 9, 15 through 17 is pretty interesting to me, too, because, you know, when we're talking about this Nephilim agenda um, in the last days, especially when it comes to aliens, right? And we know that that's uh, Revelation 16, 13, where John clearly says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay, he knew they were unclean spirits. And he said they were like frogs. Well, that's that's what we know of as an alien gray. 
So this is a vision he's having of this these alien greys popping out or or these guys speaking the words of these alien greys, right? So anyway, so we know that there's this Nephilim agenda for the end times. Um, some of it will have to do with technology. Other will have to do with bloodlines. There's a lot going on. We know that people have been um, kidnapped and abducted for years and years and years and had experiments on them. We know that they were all sexual genetic experience because we know that Satan is building an army. So if Satan is building a half-breed army, could it be right here in Revelation 9.15? So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day, the month and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. Okay, so now we've got something weird going on. Uh, some kind of weird mixture, um, that or technology, right? Um, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Well, I think the colors are, are kind of uh, interesting because every Chinese battle throughout their history has had a battle flag, a war flag. And they are all hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, and crimson red, every one of them. So there's always a natural, you know, maybe China is, is a good piece of this, of this army that comes against the Antichrist in the natural, but there's also a supernatural component to it. So, and the other thing I'm thinking of, I mean, when you think about this imagery, are these drones, are they helicopters, some kind of transformer? We don't know, but we do know that um, these Apollyon, these, these, things come out. So, and then we can look at Joel 2, which talks about the day of the Lord. Okay. When we put this together with Joel 2, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in the holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. Okay. We know the day of the Lord is when Jesus comes down, lands on, on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and goes to war with his yeah. enemy, right? Yeah. So because it's a day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, a great and great and strong, the like of whom has never been. Okay, that's kind of weird. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been. What in the world army is Satan building? Can we even imagine it? Nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. So they're, yeah. they're burning up everything in front of them and they're walking through it and it's not harming them at all. Yeah. Because behind them a flame burns. They're walking through fire. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots, over mountains they leap. What? Over mountains they leap? They have the appearance of horses? Like they, they run as fast as horses. What in the world are we talking about here? Like a noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like the strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained in color. They run like mighty men. Back to the mighty men again. They climb the wall like men of war. So they, they just scamper up walls. They climb over mountains. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. Break, break ranks. Okay, so if these guys are, are in formation and they're going over mountains and they're climbing up walls and they're not breaking ranks, uh, this is not human. This, is, this, this does not happen except for in zombie movies, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come yeah. on. 
They do not push one another. Everyone marches in its own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter the windows like a thief. What are we talking about here? What is this imagery? It is not human. It is not human. Yeah. Not at all. This, no. this has got to be the army that Satan is building. And maybe there are humans in it too, in some way, shape or form. Maybe, maybe Xi Jinping gets his super soldier wish after all. And, and he, and he puts chips in millions of his troops and because oh, it's yeah, the, this is the Kings of the East coming across the Euphrates. If you put the, the Indian army and the Chinese army together, you might be able to come up with 200 million men. Although India and China right now, they hate each other with a passion. Although they're trying to get along in this BRICS coalition, that they have major border disputes and they do not like one another at all. Well, actually, they've, they've done some data reports based off the reserves of everything. Um, they have 200 million just in China. Mm -hmm. Think about how large their country is and then do the math, just break it down to even 10% of the population total would be the military age males. And that would be, you know, they're over a billion in population. So, yeah. You know, and here's the thing is because of their one child policy, there was a lot of boys born there. It was like 70 boys to the girl. It would be a horrible place to be single because the girls were really sparse. I know that's just because I have friends in China. Yeah. So there are oh, a ton, a ton of men. They easily, between their reserves and their active military, have 200 million in their army. Oh, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that happens a lot over there is women in their 40s, women in their 50s whose husbands have died. Um, they are forced into marriage with younger men, with men in their 20s, because they can't find a woman. They can't find someone their own age. So they will marry a woman in their 40s and 50s um, just just to have a wife, somebody to take care of them. Et yeah, cetera. it's it's yeah. A, I, again, I have friends that are in like Beijing and whatnot, and it is a really, really difficult situation for young men because there's so many young men that not only is it difficult to find a spouse, but it's difficult to find a job because there's so many of them. It's, it's really uh, the only the option in the military, right? Exactly. Exactly. So they have an enormous military. They may even have more than 200 million. Um, and they did not vax their military. Yeah. They did not vax their military. So neither did Russia. We did. Uh, yikes. So, but yeah, so, but it does say the kings of the East. So that's plural. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, of course. So, so there are other nations that join in on this. And I'm just saying, you put, you put them together with India. India's got a gigantic army and they are way more technologically advanced than they let on. They've had moon missions. Um, their, their people are, I mean, the backbone of our economy here in, in the technology sector now is made up of Indians. Um, I can tell you yeah. in the company I work for, um, there might be five of us that are not Indian. All right. So now I officially have to go. Yep. Uh, I, well, I, I'll show you why, um, You'll get a kick out of this if I can get my camera to come off. Is somebody asleep down on the floor? Yeah, let me see if my camera will release for me. Come on. So guys, just just know that uh, this is a real agenda and they are going to sell it through superpowers. They are going to force it on you through if you want a job, you have to be chipped. Blah, blah, blah. So look for these things to happen. Oh, 
<laughs> yes. Yep. So if you look around, there is no place to put a coffee machine. <laughs> there is no place to put a coffee machine. Mm. It is slim. not that it wouldn't, it wouldn't fall over or or leak or something on something that would fry. <laughs> yeah, it is slim pickings. Yep. So, that being said, woo. I'm telling you that that roundabout that yeah that that said it all to see the rest of the studio. <laughs> It's a very, very small room. Yeah. Then it's there's a, a lot of stuff in there, Christopher. Holy cow. Yeah, it's a very, very small room. It's uh Sean wanted to come and stream in my studio. I was like, you don't understand. There's a spot for one person to sit. My mm -hmm. little girl pulls up a blanket and a pillow and lays on the floor and waits for me to finish. So she's asleep. I need to go put her to bed. Yeah. So... Um, I have fun with everybody and um, tomorrow is Sabbath so we won't be on tomorrow but we'll be on Saturday and uh, thank you so much everybody for joining us this evening we truly appreciate everybody coming out um, like watch will say if you haven't signed find out the rest about Lazarus yeah we're gonna go uh, that's what we're doing on Saturday we're completing the the Lazarus story on Saturday cool all right guys everybody have a good night bye-bye Cheers.